Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight, and it's May 23rd, 2014. Now, it was only about a week ago that Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs and I were walking through an American mock city where our military was planning on taking over America, small American towns in a counterinsurgency operation. Now, just yesterday, a former three-star general, a General Daniel Bolger, had a press conference where he talked about an upcoming book that's coming out on November 11th, where he writes the first after-action report on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, why we lost. And as Time Magazine points out here, they don't use the word lost lightly, and he doesn't use it lightly either. Listen to the statistics that he mentioned in the interview, of course, about what these two wars cost us. He said 6,800 U.S. troops, $2 trillion and rising, and who knows how many Afghans and Iraqis have died in that. And he says, by next Memorial Day, who is going to say that we won these two wars? We committed ourselves to counterinsurgency. There's that word again, without having a real discussion. And what does he mean by that? He says, they should have talked to the military and civilian leadership and the American public and said, hey, are you good with this? Do you want to stay here for 30 or 40 years like we did in Korea? Or are we going to run out of energy? And he says it's obvious that we ran out of energy. And this is what he said. He said, once you get past the initial knockout shot of invading a country, let's put it that way, and decide that you're going to stay a while, you better define what a while means. Because in counterinsurgency, you're talking about decades. He said, I was in the military that was planning for deployments forever, basically. That's exactly what I learned in my research when I looked at the Asymmetric Warfare Group at the conferences that they were having eight years ago, talking about what had happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, what they had learned in fighting wars against an indigenous population for the last 40, 50, 60 years, ever since World War II. They say that it's going to take decades, that it's a very long-term strategy. Well, the bottom line is, as the guy from the RAND Corporation pointed out, they have yet to win one of these. How many decades do they have to stay before they win? I believe that oppressors will never win. And as they pointed out, it was not about religion. It was about people who had been invaded, who had lost their self-determination, who had lost their freedom, who had no economic future. They coalesced around religious groups because that's where they were looking for security. But the fundamental thing that people are fighting about in Islamic countries is the same thing people will fight about in any country. And that is, you have taken away their freedom and made them slaves. He basically said, let me read one more quote from this article. He says, what we've done is basically installed authoritarian dictators. That's the fundamental problem. That's the fundamental problem with American foreign policy. And the problem in America is that we basically are installing a dictatorship, at least the framework for a dictatorship. And we understand as well as they do where this is going. They're preparing for a war that is going to force that, dicta that dictatorship down our throats and is going to respond to people when they inevitably rise against it. It was just yesterday, while he was giving this interview, there was training going on in Tampa with special forces, as we reported yesterday. And they were training not just with U.S. special forces, but with 16 foreign nations special forces. And guess what? One of those nations, the last one they mentioned, was Thailand. Guess what else happened yesterday as, they, as the Thai troops were training for counterinsurgency? They had a military coup in Thailand. Look at this headline from The Guardian. Thai military detains politicians and activists. You want to know what this is going to look like when it comes to America? Take a look at what happened in Thailand. Thailand's military has detained more than 150 politicians and activists and banned them from leaving the country. It was unclear what the army's summons entailed as media were not allowed inside the base. They told these politicians, the prime minister, the ex-prime minister, the cabinet, and many others, both pro-government and anti-government, Report to a military base. That's what it's going to look like. We've said this over and over again. Alex has said the first people up against the wall are going to be people that they perceive to be competitors to them when they seize power. So if we have an executive who becomes a dictatorship, or if we have the military that does a military coup, either way, we are treading on some very dangerous ground here. It says that they have uh, restricted these people from the military bases. They were still did not know where their whereabouts were, and they are being detained indefinitely. Does that sound familiar? Guess what? Yesterday, 
They reauthorized the NDAA with its indefinite provision plans with the fact that the military can arrest American citizens on American soil whenever they wish, essentially. Now, of course, uh, the executive that signed that, Obama, said he was not going to use that. And yet we see that Obama and the Republican House continue to pass these provisions. What does that tell us? It tells us that this is not just coming from Obama. This is something the Republicans want very badly as well. The only people who came out against this essentially were, and there was some bipartisan opposition to this, but we saw that Adam Smith, Democrat of Washington, as well as a Georgia Republican, Paul Brown, offered opposition amendments to get rid of the indefinite detention provisions. And this is what the New American says. It says, one of the most noxious elements of the NDAA is that it places the American military at the disposal of the president for the apprehension, arrest, and detention of those suspected of posing a danger to the homeland, either inside the borders of the U.S. or outside, whether the suspect is a citizen or a foreigner. And there is a frightening grant of immense and unconstitutional power to the executive branch. The president is afforded the absolute power to arrest and detain citizens of the U.S. without them being informed of any criminal charges, without a trial on the merits of those charges, and without any due process safeguards. That's exactly what is happening in Thailand. Do you think that that's impossible, that it can't happen here in America? We were warned by our founders that this is exactly what would happen if we allowed ourselves to have a permanent standing military, if we allowed power to be consolidated into the federal government. And now it's not just consolidated in the federal government, it's being consolidated into one branch. And the Republican Congress is fine with that. It was Madison who told us that if oppression and tyranny ever comes to this country, it will come in the guise of fighting a foreign enemy. And historically, that's the way it has come. And we see just this week yet another example of this. We saw Rand Paul rose to oppose the confirmation of David Barron because David Barron had written the memos that the Obama administration said gave them legal justification to kill an American citizen abroad using drones. Paul urged the Senate to not vote along partisan lines. He said, imagine if Bush were doing this. And of course, he was joined by people like Ron Wyden, a Democrat, who said, every American has the right to know when their government believes it is allowed to kill them. Yes, we need to see those memos, the memos that this guy wrote, that David Barron wrote. And yet, here we are just two years later, because they oppose this, because Paul and Grassley and Wyden and other people opposed this nomination. Finally, the administration released these memos two years after the fact to allow the Senate to see it. I'm sorry, I think it was three years. I think it was 2011. Anyway, they are still not being seen by the American public. We still have not had that discussion, just as we did not have the right kind of discussion about what kind of a commitment we were going to make in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And yet, he was confirmed to a lifetime position yesterday. As his alma mater, Harvard, points out, this Harvard Law School professor, David Barron, was confirmed by the full Senate for a seat on the bench of the U.S. First Circuit Court of Appeals, 53 to 45, essentially along partisan lines. They said that it was brought by Harry Reid, and of course, Harry Reid is the one who stopped, who changed the rules for filibusters. That's why Rand Paul did not speak for hours, he only spoke for 30 minutes, laying out the concerns about due process, and it was not, as he pointed out, about merely transparency. He said, of course, Obama will get some votes from people because he's released these documents to the Senate, but of course, the American public still has not seen those documents. And they say, it's kind of interesting in this Harvard thing that said these memos were allegedly written by Barron. We've got secret memos being written, secret trials being done by the FISA court, by the administration, where people are being killed, where our freedoms are being taken away. We're not even allowed to see these quote unquote decisions that are fundamentally changing our society taking away due process and trial by jury that has existed for over a thousand years. Now there's elections going on in England. We just had some interesting developments there. The UKIP Populist Party, led by Nigel Farage, and of course he's been a frequent guest on the Alex Jones Show. And the New York Times is trying to take down expectations here a little bit because they had such a good showing. They said, Populist Party gains as expected, 
in British election, well, of course, they're going to say, oh, yeah, we knew that was going to happen. But it was pretty significant. He won at least 150 local council seats. And prior to this, the party had only held two. They're now ranked in the third position, moving out the uh, previous party that was in third position, the liberal uh, party that was there. Now, the Guardian talks about in an opinion piece here, they talk about how the pushback against them by not only the liberals, but by the conservatives, essentially the ruling powers have pushed back against this movement by UKIP by trying to sneer at them and call them, guess what? Racists. Yes, that's always the epithet that's hurled at everyone. That's the easiest thing to do is to call them racist, to paint little Nazi mustaches on his pictures. And yet, Remember, Nigel Farage is the guy who called out Herman von Rompuy for taking out democratically elected leaders and appointing what they called technocrats. These are essentially Goldman Sachs bankers to run countries. And he said, who are you to do that? And he said famously that you, you look like a third-rate bank clerk. Well, actually, he was acting like a bank clerk, putting these bankers in power. Now, in this article, John Harris, The Guardian, writes that you don't have to be an idiot of some description, either bigoted or duped and worthy of little more than contempt to vote for UKIP. He says, if a party is averaging 47% of the vote in a labor stronghold and Tories from their perches in crucial conservative territory apparently heading towards first place in the European contest, something important is obviously afoot. Yes, it is. Now, what that article was pointing out was that it's not just labor people. It's not just conservatives. It's a broad base contempt for the kind of government that's being forced upon Europe as part of the EU and the Euro management. People don't like what's being pushed on them. And where did that originate? Well, it originated at Bilderberg. At one of their first meetings, they planned all of this and they're executing it. But now the people are pushing back. It's not just in the UK. It's also in France and in other places where people are pushing back against this kind of rule. It's one of the reasons we're going to Bilderberg is to take the pulse of the people there as well as to see what's happening. And of course, it was admitted yesterday by one of the people heavily involved in Bilderberg that it is far more important in terms of decision making than, say, Davos, where all the mainstream media goes. Bilderberg, he said, is where they really make the important decisions, like the euro, like the EU. Now, as we see these decisions being taken out of our hand, as we see the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq being run for decades and yet still lost, there's another war that's been running for even longer, and that's the war on drugs. And in that war, there have been over 120,000 Mexican people have died in that war, another 27,000 missing. Compare that to the 6,800 American troops who died in the two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And now we see evidence that this kind of violence is moving to the United States. Look at this report from KHOU in Houston. They say El Paso police are investigating two mysterious billboards that just appeared off of I-10, each with a mannequin hanging from a noose. And the regional manager for Lamar Outdoor Advertising, who does billboards, says this is not an advertisement. Now, these billboards were vandalized. And listen to what they put up there. In Spanish, they wrote, silver or lead. In other words, you're either going to take bribes from the drug cartels or we're going to shoot you. This is a warning that they put up over and over again in Mexico. And the fact that they have a mannequin dressed in a suit and tie hanging there is also a threat to governments and business owners. We've already had law enforcement against prohibition point out that 80% of the shootings in Chicago are drug related. If you want to know the cause of people getting killed by firearms, it's illegal drugs. It's not the fact that people have second amendment rights, it's illegal drugs, but it's going to get much worse. We had just a week or two ago, news that in Minnesota, some teenagers were tortured by a rival Mexican drug gang in Minnesota. Now we see this border town in El Paso having the same kinds of warnings and threats of violence that we've seen in Mexico with a full-scale war that is far more violent than anything our soldiers have seen in Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of casualties, 120,000 versus 6,800 casualties in those two wars. Now, this long-term war on drugs is really based on nothing more than absurdities, the absurdity of prohibition.